This is episode 49 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear about the life of Harlan Tarbell, the teacher of magicians. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode number 49. First, I'd like to give a big happy belated birthday to Harry Houdini, who celebrated his birthday on April the 6th this past week. Of course, we know his real birthday was March 24th, but for whatever reason, he chose April 6th as his actual birthday. So please have a piece of cake on behalf of old Harry, who would have been 146 years old had he lived. And had he lived, he'd be the oldest person alive from the modern age. Though it's a little less than a month away, Potter and Potter Auctions uh, will have their May Magic Auction on May 2nd, 2020. So if anyone has any money left by then, it should be an interesting auction. In the sad news department, Magic Live has canceled their convention this year. Also, I just heard that the IBN convention in July has been postponed, uh, and you're probably likely to see more of that happening, unfortunately, given our state of the world right now. On the good side, the amount of magic videos continues to grow online. It seems everybody is trying to put out some sort of video. Some are unquestionably bad, um, but but uh, others are quite good, and some are even exceptional. And having done many videos myself, not during this session, but in the past, uh, I will say a little preparation goes a long way. And you can tell those people that have done the preparation from those who are just winging it. I think everybody clearly means well. Uh, but there are people that are struggling. And you know what? Sometimes you just have to get out there and try it um, to get the experience with it. So so there's that side of it as well. Kudos to everybody who's trying to do something productive during this time of uncertainty. Truth be told, I've done a video myself. In fact, um, I may have been one of the first, but I didn't do it for the general public. I only did it for my clients and their families, and it was only available to them. And surprisingly, it got a huge amount of views. So I was thrilled by that. Um, I've considered doing a magic detective video of some kind, but as of right now, uh, not exactly sure what I would do and kind of got my hands full with another project. So at least you'll still be getting the podcasts. That's a good thing. So let's get on to today's feature. I have to say, I totally love this guy, the subject of today's podcast. Where would we be without the Tarbell Course in Magic? Really? I mean, it's been the cornerstone of many a magician's education. And if you believe my old friend, the late Denny Haney, everything is in Tarbell. Well, I'd say pretty much everything. A couple things, maybe not. But for the most part, everything really is in Tarbell. The subject of today's podcast was born Harlan Eugene Tarbell on February 23rd, 1890 in Delavan, Delavan, Illinois, to be exact. When asked, he would often tell people he was born in Delavan under a cabbage leaf. The family moved to Peoria and then to Groveland, Illinois. It was here when on one Sunday morning, the newspaper arrived and there was a column in the newspaper devoted to teaching magic tricks. Harlan learned some of these and became interested in magic. Soon thereafter, a traveling salesman came to town who just by chance used magic in his sales pitches. Harlan went to see this fellow, and the two spoke after his performances. The man told Harlan about this great magical place called Roderberg's, which was in Chicago. Now, what I love about this is a while back, a couple years ago, I guess, I wrote a blog article about August Roderberg. And one of the things I learned while doing the research was that he would often teach classes, magic classes, to traveling salesmen. He'd teach them simple tricks that they could use in their presentations. And now, here was proof that his system was successful. Now, 
when you think of Rotenberg, what you have to re realize, this is 100 years or so before the internet. So the old way of doing things was to write away for a catalog, which would be a printed booklet with all the inventory that the magic store carried. Rotenberg was known to make things on the fly as well. Many of the people who owned early magic shops were skilled craftsmen. Rotenberg was no exception. Harling Tarbell would order props from the Rotenberg catalog. And now think about this. He would send away for the props, pay in advance, and then wait. And wait. And wait until they showed up. Sometimes weeks, maybe months before they'd arrive. We get upset when an item doesn't show up in three days. So imagine having to wait three months. These early props that Tarbell purchased would allow him to begin doing shows locally for various events. Keep in mind, he's a kid magician, and that's fine. Many a magician began as a kid doing shows for local groups and organizations. When he was 13, Tarbell saw his first professional magician, and it was Charles Carter. Charles Carter would go on to become a globe-trotting illusionist doing numerous tours across the planet. At this point in time, however, he was working in the Lyceum circuit. Then the next big name, who wasn't quite a big name yet, was Harry Jansen, performing as Hare Jansen. He had not yet been christened Dante. It said that Harlan Tarbell walked five miles along a railroad track to, to the next town in order to see Jansen perform. In Volume 2 of the Tarbell Course in Magic, Harlan Tarbell mentions both Rodeberg and Dante on page 294. Of Rodeberg, he says, Many years ago, August Rodeberg, the Chicago magic dealer, figured that it might be well to unhinge the half shells used in ball manipulation and use them separately. In other words, prior to this, two half shells were hinged together during a billiard ball routine. Anyone familiar knows the way that they're done today. And it apparently dates to August Rodeberg, the one who changed that methodology. Of Jansen, he writes, Dante, then known as Herr Jansen, made his clever manipulation and magic with billiard balls a feature of his show. Showing one ball, he suddenly caused four balls to appear between his fingers. It should be pointed out that even though magic seemed to have its claws firmly clasped upon Harlan Tarbell, he had something else that interested him as well. This second interest also began in his youth, and that was drawing or illustration. He was naturally gifted, but did take a correspondence course as well as apprenticed with professional illustrators. However, by the time he was 12, he was already doing commercial artwork. He would do illustrations, cartoons. He even did a cover of a magic catalog. A few years later, he attended the Bradley Polytechnic Institute in Peoria. He took another correspondence course in illustration from Charles J. Strong, a professional poster artist. His skill as an artist is probably overlooked because we think of him as the magician and as the teacher. But he did all these illustrations for the course which would bear his name, as well as in the book Greater Magic and other books. He also did illustrations and cartoons for magic magazines. Harlan Tarbell capped off his education by graduating from the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts. Perhaps a crowning achievement in art was being able to study with French Impressionist Claude Monet during his time in France during World War I. Speaking thereof, in 1917, Harlan Tarbell was drafted into military service. He would be a medic with the 24th Balloon Company in France. Yes, you heard that right. Balloon Company. I was actually unaware, but balloons and dirigibles played a significant role in World War I, both as a way of observing the battlefield, but also as a way to carry bombs and, and drop bombs on enemy locations and more. I suppose this was where he got the name Doc Tarbell, though he was also involved in something else called nephropathy. Nephropathetic medicine is a system of health care that employs manual medicine, nutritional counseling, and therapeutic modalities, specializing in the treatment of pain caused by connective tissue disorders. When this occurs, it can often result in pain and inflammation to the affected area of the body. In 1920, he married Martha Beck. The Tarbells had two children and several grandchildren, which makes me believe that there are still descendants of Harlan Tarbell alive today. 
and I hope they get a chance to hear this podcast. In 1934, Harlan Tarbell directed a short eight-minute silent movie called Buck Rogers in the 25th Century. He even played the part of Dr. Hewer, a scientist. This was for the 1933-34 Chicago World's Fair, and if I'm understanding this, he also did a live version of the show, along with some very clever illusions. But uh, perhaps the two were used together. I'm, I'm kind of confused by this. There are several articles in the Sphinx magazine that mention the show, but they don't say it was a movie. So it sounds like it was a live show. That's why I'm assuming that there were two separate things. Although it could be that the eight-minute silent movie is what contained the uh, illusions. Not exactly clear on that, unfortunately. If I might mention quickly a couple contributions to the magic world that were Tarbell's creations, uh, and I was unaware of both of these. First was the self-contained color-changing silk that today is found in about every kid's magic set, but as it turned out, it was Harlan Tarbell's creation. Next was the vanishing metal cane, and this came about, he was over in Europe and he had purchased a a supply of some sort of folding cane that could be stored in a top hat. These canes were made to stay open. So Tarbell had a mechanic wind one in the opposite direction so that it would collapse and stay collapsed, thus the vanishing cane. He had other creations as well, like the Tarbell egg bag and the Hindu, the Tarbell Hindu rope trick, which is featured within the Tarbell Course in Magic. And actually, from what I've read, that he had 200 or so original creations. So I'm assuming that many of them are within the pages of the course. And now let's speak of the course. The Course in Magic began as an idea of Walter Jordan, who was an advertising man. A client of Jordan's had his own correspondence school, and Jordan asked if, if a magic course would work. And the answer was, well, it was two thumbs up. In other words, yes. So the task was to find the right magician to write the course. First up was a magician named Jim Sherman from Chicago, but he wanted too much money. By the way, the year was 1926. Next was a magician named Walter Baker, but they didn't really like what he had submitted, so they decided to go elsewhere. Next, they went to Harry Houdini, who was in town playing at the Princess Theater. He liked the idea, but said he was too busy to write it himself, so he suggested Harlan Tarbell. As it happens, Tarbell's name had come up earlier in the process, too, so the publishers decided to just go with Harlan Tarbell instead of all the other men. Imagine that, though. It was almost the Houdini course in magic. Now let me add one small thing to this. My friend John Cox told me that he heard from Max Maven the Houdini story with the Tarbell course was not true. However, he never got the full scoop. So I'm going with what's written in Volume 7 under the title, The Story of the Tarbell Course in Magic. And maybe one day we'll get the, uh, the full story from Max Maven, which would be really uh, interesting as well. In June 1926, the Tarbell system of magic was incorporated and it was on its way. The original price for the home study course was to be $50 cash or $60 if it was on the payment plan. The course came with a 9 by 12 inch box that would hold the lessons and also the props that were included with the course. A wand, a dozen palming coins, wand shells, a pole, small glass, a glass disc, paper rings, metal rings, etc. The course sold well until the Great Depression. According to Tarbell himself, the Depression killed it. The course was dead at that point. At least until 1940, when Lou Tannen bought the course for $5,000 with plans to turn it into a volume of books. Tarbell worked on the new set of books, cleaning up some of the old material and creating new material for the book. This would last right up until 1960, when Harlan Tarbell died. Volumes 1 through 6 were written and illustrated by Harlan Tarbell. He had been working on Volume 7 when he passed away, so Volume 7 sat unfinished for a while. Then, Lou Tannen asked Harry Lorraine to write the book, with Ed Michelle as the illustrator. 
The material in that book was chosen by Harry Lorraine, with the exception of the few Tarbell routines that were included. The book does include an important thing in the back of the book, indexes for all the volumes. These are broken down into title indexes, name indexes, meaning the name of the people mentioned throughout the volumes, and then amazingly, by category, which is alphabetical by volume number. Volume 7 includes a trick by David Copperfield when he was just a kid and his name was not yet Copperfield. It also contains what I think is the first ever in print version of The Crazy Man's Handcuffs, which was made famous by Michael Amar and others. But it doesn't end there, because in 1993, Harlan Tarbell comes back from the dead to write Volume 8 and do the illustrations. Actually, the owner of D. Robbins & Company, the current publisher of the Tarbell course, had been working with Steve Burton to create another volume. They found they had enough material, Tarbell material, from the original course to do a book that was about half the size of the original books. So in comes Richard Kaufman, who contacts a number of other people, Jay Marshall, George Daly, Mario Carandi, Robert Lund, Tom Ranson, and David Copperfield, to see if they can come up with enough extra Tarbell material to fill out the book. As it was, Tarbell had contributed material to Magic Magazines and had a number of booklets he had written during his life. This material was gathered and put into Volume 8. There are a few pages in the back of Volume 8 which explain where the various effects in that book came from. The Tarbell course today includes eight volumes. There's also the Tarbell Companion by Harlan Tarbell and edited by Steve Burton, which has even more Tarbell material. And then there is the Tarbell System Incorporated, which is the original Correspondence Magic course in book form, and another book called The Original Tarbell Lessons in Magic, also in book form. The Tarbell course has been translated into multiple languages. Besides the Tarbell course in magic, Harlan Tarbell did illustrations for the book Greater Magic. He also did art for other magicians, including a lithograph for Eugene Laurent, graphic work for the magazine The Seven Circles, and catalogs for the Chicago Magic Company. His real job was working for the T.S. Denison and Company Publishers. They produced sheet music and books, and he was the art editor. They also published some of the books that Tarbell wrote, like his Chalk Talk books. Today, we don't see Chalk Talks, but they were popular for many years in the 20th century, and sort of a natural thing for Tarbell to do. Chalk Talks were drawings upon large sheets of paper. Chalk Talks meant that as you spoke, you drew. So you were drawing a picture and the audience kind of assumed that they were seeing one thing because they were following the story. And then at some point you would turn the page a little bit and all of a sudden they would see a completely different image um, from what you had drawn. In other words, the picture would change depending upon the direction of the paper. Volume 8 of the Tarbell course contains a chapter on Chalk Talks. Tarbell was also more than just a teacher and an illustrator. He was also a very busy part-time performer. His show was in two parts and had some really interesting effects. Act 1 was called Magic of the Ages. It would appear that much of what he did was presented in costume and much of the magic was themed. For example, he had several tricks with the, the word Egyptian in the title, like the Extraordinary Egyptian Juggling, for example. He did a routine called A Charles Dickens Christmas Party in which he presented The Wandering Die and then another routine called Magical Cooking. And it's likely that this was something similar to what Charles Dickens had done. So he's uh, basically schooling the audience on the fact that Charles Dickens, the great author, was also an amateur magician. Next, he shifts to what he calls Chinese tricks and finishes the set with his own Tarbell Hindu rope mystery. Act two is called Mysteries of the Mind and looks to be a combination of spirit effects along with mentalism. There's a, a magazine psychometry trick, something called the telepathic pictures, and he finishes with his signature eyeless vision where he has himself thoroughly blindfolded and is able to see objects that are held up near his fingertips. Tarbell was known to bill himself as a master magician and mentalist. He taught his eyeless vision act to both Stuart Kramer and John Calvert. 
1949 and 50, he was president of the Society of American Magicians. I found it fascinating to learn that in 1950, Tarbell was performing at the elementary school of cardman and magician John Rockenbomber. John was inspired to learn magic after seeing Tarbell perform, and especially after receiving Volume 1 of the course. Harlan Tarbell died June 16, 1960, at the age of 70 of cardiac arrest. He's buried in the St. Mary's Cemetery in Elmhurst, Illinois. He's buried in the Tarbell family plot, along with his father, mother, wife, and brother Robert, who only lived to the age of two. Special note here, there is another Harlan associated with the Tarbell course that I'd like to make well, I'd like to make you aware of. That would be Dan Harlan. A couple years ago, he took the entire Tarbell course and put it to video. And in many cases, he updated and adapted the tricks to modern times. The course is available through penguinmagic.com. It's known as Tarbell, Every Trick in the Book. These are video downloads. It was a Herculean effort, to say the least. And there's so much great material that he presents. It's just amazing. So if you like, you can read the Tarbell course and digest it that way. Or you could watch the Tarbell course and learn it from Dan Harlan that way. Either way, both will be beneficial to any magician, amateur, or professional. Now, if you've ever heard the expression, it's in Tarbell, let me tell you a funny story. Uh, this is a number of years back. I was hanging out at Denny's Magic Shop in Baltimore one night, and I brought up the sack escape trick that Doug Henning had done on one of his TV specials. That trick fooled the daylights out of me, and I had poured through all the Tarbell books to see if it was in there, and it wasn't. So anyway, I'm at Denny's, and I ask him about Henning's sack escape. And without missing a beat, Denny says, it's in volume five of Tarbell. Now keep in mind, I've already gone through the entire Tarbell course. I know everything that's in there. I have looked. I, there's a sack escape in there. I've looked at it. I know that's not it. So I tell Denny, no, no. I know that. I know what you're referring to. That ain't it. He looks at me. He goes, that's it. Trust me. That's it. So, you know, who doesn't trust Denny? So I go home and I look it up and I'm like, I've looked at this a dozen times. I was sure this wasn't it. But sure enough, that's the method that Doug Henning used to do his sack escape. And it's just, oh, the method is so great you don't even you don't even see it happen, but it's a little more apparent in the illustrations. I guess that's what fooled me. But uh, once again, there it was in Tarbell. Got to give it to Denny. Now there's another trick in the Tarbell course that this one surprised me. Harry Anderson used to do this uh, torn bill to impossible location trick, and I had seen him do it a number of times, and I always thought, yeah, maybe this is something not right about it. I thought maybe there was a stooge involved because it just seemed too impossible. Um, well, it turns out that that trick is in the Tarbell Course in Magic and it isn't impossible. It's diabolically clever and easy to do and got to hand it to Harry for finding that gem within the pages of Tarbell. There's another thing in Tarbell. Terry Lunsford put out a trick called the Pro Viper, which was a, a electronic snake basket. Well, the precursor to that is in the pages of Tarbell, not the electronic version, but the early version that the um, that Terry's was based on. It's amazing what you find within the pages of Tarbell. And finally, there's this piece that was written in Tarbell Volume Eight that is very eerily topical for today. I'm going to read directly from Volume 8. My thoughts go back to the First World War, not just to the entertainment I could bring to others, but the good I could do in relieving emotional tension because of the people's confidence in the power of the magician. It was during the fall of 1918. I had enlisted in the Army as a food chemist, and someone at Kelly Field, Texas, mistook me as a balloon chemist. So I was rushed over to a balloon company as a medical man. We were stationed up in the mountains, 
in France at a place called Randan, a bus stop between Clermont and Ferrand and Mont d'Or. I used to go into the neighboring French villages and perform tricks for the townspeople. One day, I was biting some French coins in two and putting them together again and changing water to wine and vice versa when I heard someone moaning in the next room. It was a grandma with a towel wrapped around her head. "'What's the matter, Grandmere?' I said. She pointed to her head, and in French she told me it was such a bad headache she felt she would die." So being a graduate napropathic physician, I gave her a manipulative treatment on the neck which eased the tension and relieved the pain. I shall never forget the surprise on her face. Magic. It seemed the easiest explanation for the moment. From that time on, I was known as the magic doctor, among the peasants, for the news of the Grand Mere's vanishing headache spread like wildfire. Then one day the flu came. It struck suddenly. People were dying rapidly. Fear had taken over. And it was then that someone thought of the magic doctor. A knock came at my door. I opened the door and there stood a lady in her donkey cart. Bring your magic and save us, she pleaded. People, my people, are dying. You must come immediately. I thought of the story of the epidemic going down into Italy to kill 5,000 people, but 50,000 died. 5,000 died from the epidemic, but the extra 45,000 died from fear. I also thought of the words of the great healer who once said, Your faith has made you whole. So I grabbed some lemons and some medical supplies, climbed into the donkey cart, and drove into the village three kilometers away. People were out to meet me. I stood up in the cart, gave them my blessings, and said, Fear not. From now on, none of you will die from this epidemic. Then I must have lost a little faith or had a little touch of intuition, for I added, Except for one person who it's too late to save. Take me to your worst case first. So I was taken into the home of a woman who had lost her husband, her brother, and her child within five days. They said she and her mother were dying. Women sat about the room with crucifixes. As I entered the room, I heard the death rattle, and the elderly woman had died. See, it is an epidemic, they cried. Fear not, I said. Spread the news that no one else will die from this epidemic. I went to work on the younger woman, a magic potion from lemon juice, hot packs. I called them magic potions. A magic mark with chalk on the bed. Anything to restore confidence. Then I went from house to house with my magic marks, potions, and good cheer. Now you can believe this or not, but when I went back to that village some time later, not one single person had died from this epidemic. The flu had been conquered. Then, more than ever, I realized what faith could do in an emotional emergency. Okay. So, by today's standards, we might even think what he did was unethical. Now, keep in mind, it was a different time. But there are some similarities to our own situation. 1918, there was the big influenza epidemic. Today, it's COVID-19 or the coronavirus or whatever you desire to call it. But we're being bombarded with negativity from the news constantly. I believe they, more than anyone, are to blame for the fear that has gripped the nation, and not just our nation, but all over the world. I'm not saying that the virus isn't real. It's real. It's all too real. Very dangerous. People are dying. There's no question about that. But I think the fear needs to be put into perspective. I think people are doing, I think they're doing a better job all over the globe with self-isolation. Hopefully soon, Things will improve. Doctors will find a vaccine against this and positive treatments for it. I'll tell you what I am sick and tired of hearing, and that's the phrase, things will never go back to the way they were. Excuse me, but that's crap. The Black Plague of Europe, also known as the Bubonic Plague, wiped out upwards of 200 million people. The cholera pandemic of the 19th century killed 1 million people. 
The flu pandemic of 1918 killed between 20 and 50 million people. The Asian flu of the 1950s killed 2 million people. The flu pandemic of 1968 killed 1 million people. And every time, we, the human race, went back to normal. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen. Have a little faith. If you're the praying type, spend some time in prayer. If nothing else, fill your head with positive thoughts rather than all the negative. Take the proper precautions. Take care of your families. People will still die and people will recover. The majority of the people who get sick recover. Each day, we're getting closer to overcoming this. Great people are at work all over the globe to solve this dilemma. At the same time, there are nefarious people out there trying to take advantage. Be wary of them. Be smart, be careful, take care of yourselves, and have a little faith. We will get through this. And that, my friends, is episode 49 of the Magic Detective Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, please like the podcast by hitting whatever like feature your podcast provider has for you. Feel free to share the podcast with anyone you think would enjoy it. And until next time, I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Be well and be safe.